Hi everyone, this is Dale. Thanks for attending this talk and taking the time out of your day to listen. By way of introduction, I'm one of the founders of AI Reverie, a startup focusing on the generation of high quality synthetic data to help train the computer vision algorithms of the future. To provide some background on what we'll be talking about, we'll focus on our particular philosophy when it comes to synthetic data within the context of computer vision, where we define synthetic data as images generated from a simulated environment. We'll start with the basics and move more towards some lessons we learned, wrapping up with some interesting use cases that we're currently tackling. My hope is that by the end of this talk, I've successfully shared why we're so excited about the way synthetic data can be used to help solve some of the most difficult problems in computer vision. So to begin, let's first discuss how computer vision typically works these days. And this sequence you see here represents a common workflow for many practitioners. It usually starts with images that have been captured using the physical camera sensor itself. After this step is done, it's often followed by a human in the loop process that requires annotators to label things of interest. It's important to note that the more sophisticated the annotation is, the more laborious it can be to label, but it provides for a much richer analysis of the image itself. For example, if you only care about where something is located within an image, a simple bounding box around the object might suffice. But once you start looking to get a robot to grasp something, you might need something like a segmentation mask to flesh out the fine contours of the object. So once this data is collected and labeled, we can then train this algorithm using a number of algorithms out there on GitHub. And once it's trained, it is often incorporated into an edge device, like a smart camera, to be sold to consumers or businesses. For practitioners in modern computer vision, the greatest bottleneck throughout this whole process has often been data. The first two steps I outlined in the previous slide of collecting and annotating the data usually take several months. Another reason why data is the real bottleneck is that algorithms these days are a dime a dozen, and hundreds of new ones pop up at these amazing conferences. Datasets are unfortunately much rarer because of the amount of time and costs associated with creating them, and this is why it's so important for us to solve this key bottleneck in order to move the field forward. In general, we feel there are three major bottlenecks associated with getting good data. The first is just getting the data itself. I'll talk more about the challenges of collecting data in the next slide, but for many of the companies we work with, it's the collection itself that becomes a huge bottleneck. The second issue is that once you have this data, annotations are often mislabeled, and these errors can throw your algorithm in a serious rut. There have been so many times that we chatted with companies who have had to spend many hours fixing the annotations they received from outsourced labelers, which is clearly not the best use of their time. Finally, the third major problem and perhaps the most critical part of the equation here is simply the overall labor costs. Labor in terms of the employees collecting the data, annotators who are labeling them, and the computer vision folks who are often looking over them again for errors. As you might guess, we believe that synthetic data can solve these problems and more. And what do we mean by more? I'd like to first state that there are many inherent limitations of using real data. Imagine creating a blue whale detector for an autonomous submarine. You'd have to somehow get your sensor to find these majestic creatures, and then there's no guarantee they'll wait around to help train your future vision algorithm. The next issue here is privacy. Would you want your smart home device to be collecting data while you're at home in your bathrobe? Most folks would probably say no. So for scenarios where there's sensitive information that can be used to identify people, collecting that data can become a major challenge. Another issue that we've heard from companies are scenarios where data has been captured using a sensor from a certain angle, but then being unable to move its perspective again because of how much they already spent annotating it. Finally, we talked about hard to find images but there are sometimes images you might need that happen so infrequently that you'll most likely never get a chance to capture them at all. These are your black swan event, your major accidents, natural disasters, among others. 
as you might infer, synthetic data can bypass all of these issues. And the big point here is that there are advantages other than cost that synthetic data can provide. But costs are important. So let's consider some of the costs associated with annotating data. Generally speaking, you'll have to pay around 10 cents for a labeler to put a box around an object within an image. Once you start moving to things like segmentation masks, that's going to cost you an average of $6 an image. If you need hundreds of thousands of these images, the cost can become absolutely prohibitive. However, with synthetic data, the marginal costs really just scale with GPU time. And from our estimates, that becomes less than a penny for any kind of annotation you want, along with the creation of the image itself. So one question I ask folks is, what's the better technology to scale? The one where we use human laborers to mindlessly segment images, or the technology that provides all the benefits I just mentioned with this reduction in costs? Take a second to consider that. But of course, the million dollar question that then comes up is whether synthetic data is actually as good as real world data. And if we wish to go this route, what's the thing we need to focus on to ensure that it's effective in training vision algorithms? From all the work we've done in this area, what you really have to think about when it comes to great synthetic data is diversity and how you can scale that diversity within your scenes. It's not just about getting things to render with photorealistic lighting as you often see in CGI cutscenes. The key issue with synthetic data is that the algorithm needs to not learn the biases inherent within your simulated environment. And to do that, you need to help create enough diversity within the data so that it doesn't pick up on the one weird nuance associated with the scenes you're generating. So for us, the way we approach this can really be broken down into an obsession with proceduralism. How do we create procedural worlds, procedural 3D models, with procedural textures placed on top of them? How do we create dynamic behavior and ensure that no two scenarios repeat? Solving this has been one of the most challenging engineering problems that shapes our work at AI Reverie. I'd like to provide an example of how we leverage proceduralism in the two images below. The left is a real-world satellite image of Newark Airport in New Jersey, and the right is our synthetic image where we are able to create a one-to-one -one scale of that same environment along with geometry that has been procedurally generated such as the roads and buildings. For us, we've taken the approach of coupling our procedural tools with real-world data to help offset biases that can occur in simulated environments. By generating them this way, we are in essence creating its synthetic mirror, hoping to capture this valuable real-world information, but then freeing us to move our camera wherever we want, simulate interesting variations such as weather, time of day, the spawning of never-before-seen objects, and pretty much anything else that might be useful to make great training data. Now, we mentioned that photorealistic rendering wasn't as important as diversity. But another reason why is our belief that we're about to get there pretty soon. These are some of the scenes we've created which we rendered using better lighting techniques, which cost more time. But we believe getting these quality images in real time is right around the corner. In fact, if you haven't seen the latest Unreal Engine 5 demo, I recommend taking a look to see how far we've come. I particularly like the image on the upper right corner with these bridges. A set of overlapping bridges like this is something you'll never see in the real world, but we can take a look at this and still know that it's a legitimate scene. It's great because building worlds like these also allow us to stretch our imagination and can actually benefit us in improving the robustness of our own algorithms. So as of today, synthetic data won't completely replace real data, but we're starting to get close. I'd like to share some results from an independent study done a year ago, published at a top machine learning conference, where they have results showing that by only using 10% of the real labeled data, you can get performance as good as using all of the labeled data when augmenting with synthetic data. In this chart, the red pentagon marker establishes a benchmark for a popular real-world self-driving car data set known as Cityscapes. It turns out you can actually get better recall than training just on the real world data while having nearly the same performance and precision. For folks who aren't familiar with these metrics, think the further that marker is in the upper right quadrant, the better the performance of the vision algorithm. 
The last part of this message that I'd like to leave you with is to share our general framework when it comes to how we think about improving synthetic data. It starts off with our first pass at generating the synthetic environment in its collection. Today, this can be a few weeks, but if we have environments that are already similar, then it's usually less than a few days to tweak it for a new use case. From there, we can collect that data, and if we have some real-world images that a customer has provided, we can actually use those images to augment our data, which in many cases do not need to be labeled. There's a whole area in computer vision that looks at how we can use real-world images to improve synthetic data, and I won't go into that too much here, but if you hear of things like domain adaptation and image-to-image -image translation, those are the kinds of algorithmic techniques you can use to improve our synthetic data. Once we've completed this step, we can then train an algorithm and validate it on a small set of real-world labeled data to see how it performs. From there, we then look at the things we missed, the areas we didn't cover in the real data, and then make tweaks to our systems to generate a new data set. We wanted to share this because in the future, we think at least 90% of the data you'll need can be replaced with synthetic data as it offers a lot of unique advantages and is much easier to scale. I hope at this point I've convinced some of you that synthetic data has some serious advantages over the standard way we've been creating data for computer vision. I'm going to focus now on some interesting use cases with companies and organizations that we really enjoyed working with, and I'll go over at a high level how we've been helping them solve some of their hard data challenges. In the retail space, we worked with 7-Eleven to help build their computer vision around cashierless stores, which requires a sophisticated use of algorithms to track and monitor individuals along with the items they're about to purchase. When they started this project, they had a huge data scarcity problem, and the annotations that they were looking for, such as skeletal annotations of people's poses, were a challenging and labor-intensive process to annotate, let alone being quite expensive. On the left is an image of an early prototype of the kind of data they were working with, and we started to work with them to simulate an environment that modeled the stores they were looking to develop these algorithms for. After a few weeks, we were able to generate a ton of synthetic data, like the image you see on the left, to help bootstrap their efforts to get their computer vision up to speed. From their accounts, it wouldn't have been possible to get what you see on the right. For their algorithm to infer attributes such as pose and grasp intention without our synthetic data, we used a lot of procedural tools at our disposal to create these varied shelf layouts, 3D models, and algorithmically driven animations to improve the diversity of our synthetic data. One project that highlights another important advantage of synthetic data was in the airplane detection challenge that the folks at Cosmic Labs were looking to solve. They realized that for certain planes of interest, there was little to no data that could easily be found from real-world satellite images. They partnered with us to help generate this synthetically, and we decided to use some of our world generation tools to recreate over two dozen synthetic mirrors of real-world airports that could act as the foundation for our synthetic data. We then spawned 3D models of many of the rare planes in almost every weather and lighting condition while also changing the perspective of the camera to represent off-media perspectives. Here are some additional images that came out of this. In the image to the left, you can see the real satellite image overlaid with our synthetic image in the middle to show the correspondence between real-world airports. In the image to the right are just thumbnails of these synthetic images captured in various conditions, showing the flexibility of using simulation environments for the purposes of generating this data. We plan to actually release this data set to the public in the next few weeks, accompanied by a paper describing our initial results. We hope that this data set, in partnership with COSMIC, can help advance research into using synthetic data, as well as algorithms that attempt to bridge that gap between synthetic and real data. Finally, the last use case that I'm excited to share with you is our work with Blue River Technologies in helping them with the problem of weed detection in agriculture. To provide some context, if you think about how herbicides are currently being used to kill weeds, they are often sprayed ad hoc across the entire field with little to no precision. 
This fundamentally is a computer vision problem because if you are able to solve the problem of knowing exactly where the weeds are, then it's actually estimated that a targeted spray of herbicides could reduce the use of these chemicals by up to 95%. Imagine now, if we have a perfect vision algorithm to detect these weeds, we can actually learn how to grasp them via a robot and not use herbicides at all. The potential impact of this can be extraordinary, not only to improve crop yields across the board, but also to limit the number of chemicals entering our food in the first place. To help solve this problem for Blue River, we actually developed a procedural plant generation system that corresponds to real-world stages of vegetation for crops and weeds. We looked at ways we can incorporate style transfer to take high-resolution leaf textures, scan from real leaves into the individual synthetic leaves that we were procedurally generating. The images you see here reflect some of the fidelity we are able to achieve in regards to its realism and the diversity we are able to generate using our procedural tools. We are super excited to know that our data might be used one day to help such a fundamental problem that exists in agriculture. So I hope this was useful and gave you a sense of why we are so excited at AI Reverie to push the ball forward with synthetic data. Thanks again for your time, and feel free to reach out to us if there are ways synthetic data might help solve some of your hard computer vision challenges.